done. And then uh, we're going to show actually a little video clip from an uh, interview on television that I did about a year ago. And then um, Carol is going to speak about um, how law students can be involved, or as young lawyers can be involved in uh, work on nonprofit boards, I believe. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, basically, I was born without a sense of smell. And I was never diagnosed, and no one ever knew about it until I was about 16 years old. Um, when I was in, I think, grade 10 or grade 11, some guys dropped a stink bomb in the hallway at school and everyone ran away except for me. And then I sort of went home and told my parents that we had to go to a doctor because I thought something was wrong with me. And at that point, the neurologist did an MRI scan and discovered that part of my brain was sort of either had never developed or was missing for whatever reason. And um, basically, it's only the part that deals with smell. It's the olfactory bulbs and then also the nerve that goes down from the brain into the nose. So basically, smells go into my nose but then don't get transferred up to my brain and are never processed. So I can't ever smell anything. And it's called anosmia. And so at age 16, I basically didn't do anything about it. But then later on, after my first year of law school in Toronto, I spent um, all my evenings basically during one summer doing a lot of research gathering a lot of information from websites and books and wherever. And I started to put it all together onto a website um, that I sort of built myself using, using you know, angel fire, like very unprofessional. And um, it basically got a lot of hits. And so I decided eventually to make it more official. Um, I decided that it was probably better to have a bit of a veil between myself and this work. So I decided to incorporate it as a nonprofit. And in Canada, this process is really different from how you do it in the States. And I believe Howie can speak a little bit as to how it's done in the States. But in Canada, you can incorporate as a nonprofit the same way as you incorporate as a you know, for-profit corporation. There are some differences, like it requires three directors instead of just one director. Um, so it's me and my parents. And um, it requires you to basically um, draft up articles of incorporation, which are relatively easy even after just one year of law school to do. And then you have to fill out a bunch of forms for the government. They're all available online. It's actually a very easy process to do. And then um, you send in your money. And then if it gets approved by the government, they send you, um, you know, all the documents, uh, letters, patents, and then you're officially a nonprofit organization or corporation. Then if you want to actually raise money and give out tax receipts for this, there's a different process you have to do, which is the reason why it's different from in the States. And basically, you have to fill out um, a lot a lot of other forms, a lot of other requirements. You have to really prove that you're going to do good things with this money. You can't do your goals, your corporate goals can't involve any um, government lobbying or things like that. So, for example, my goals that I had just drafted off the top of my head originally included, like, you know, trying to get the government to change their policies on anosmia to make it recognize as a disability or whatever. And I had to take those out because I had a friend who worked in the office of this government organization that does these registrations and he said if you have that in your goals you won't be able to get um, charitable status. So it's very complicated and probably takes a long time so I never actually did it but I also wanted to take some tax classes and everything first before I start giving out you know tax receipts. So that hasn't been done yet but now Howie's working on um, incorporating here and I believe once you incorporate here it's automatically you can automatically give out tax receipts. So this is the website that is the new professional website. Um, I did it after I had gone through the incorporation. I decided I should have like a real domain name and a real hosting. So um, you know, it also is just a question of filling out the forms and paying the money. I got the domain name, and I, it's one of the few expenses that I have um, I'm just paying for it every year. And then I got a volunteer, a friend of my family's, who volunteered to completely build it all herself. and. Whenever I have something that I want to add, she does it all herself, and it's actually really terrific. So it's completely done on volunteer basis. I mean, there's no one getting paid to do this work, and how and Jackson are doing it pro bono this year. So um, I can go through the website a little bit, but you can probably see it. The URL is www.nosmiafoundation.org. <coughs> and it's got a lot of uh, links to my email address, and people um, who come to this website always email me, and it's terrific, actually. I encourage people to email me with their questions or their comments. So I've got a lot of you know, very enthusiastic comments. People are very happy to see this website. I've also had a lot of criticisms, people who write to me and say, how dare you say that this is a disability? It's not at all. I've lived with it my whole life, and I'm fine. You're going like, to cause me problems in my workplace, you know, things like that. But then there are other people who say, 
I really want this to be considered officially a disability because I can't get my health insurance coverage to pay for my treatments or to pay for whatever it is that I need because nobody knows about this. So this is some of the work that I've been trying to do. Um, there's something in that red box that says on the topic of Zikam or Zikam. That's a product some of you might actually own. It's um, a cold remedy, like a common cold remedy. I think it's either a spray you spray in your nose or it's like a cotton swab that you put in your nose to cure the cold. And they're being sued right now by this guy, Dennis, who's actually um, contacted me a lot about his uh, lawsuit because he used this product and the next day lost a sense of smell. And he's not the only one. A lot of people have had this um, reaction to this product. So um, he's suing, and I think there's also like five other lawsuits going on at the same time. Um, so if you go to my website, you can find a lot of links to information about that. Um, I've got, I guess I should probably go through it and show the details, but that's probably too complicated for now. But um, basically there are um, information about treatments, information about the causes. I mean, all this stuff comes from other sources that I've you know, put into my website and tried to get together. So Jackson's work is to make sure that everything has copyright clearance. Um, so he's in charge of basically, I guess now contacting all these people whose works have been cited and making sure we have their permission. And he's actually gonna try to get the permission for um, the television interview to be also um, somehow digitally put onto the website, at least in part. So that's the work that they're doing. <laughs> Um, do you want to speak right yeah. now quickly? Sorry, I just have to leave. Um, I guess what I'm doing is interesting on two levels because in one sense it's sort of comparative law, just comparing comparing the different rules, rules of incorporation for... Does this work? Well, okay. I think no, we, we continue. Right? Yeah, I think... Okay, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so... Anyway, what I was saying was, what I'm doing is interesting on two levels. Um, in one sense, it's comparative law because you're really comparing the rules of incorporation uh, between Canada and the United States, and on another level, just the laws of incorporation in the U.S. and how those operate. And so I've been working with uh, Professor Cox trying to figure out what the North Carolina general statutes are on the laws of incorporation and trying to see how that's different for nonprofits and how that's different for um, nonprofits that wish to accept donations. And there are lots of different little rules that are complicated and involved and, and trying to sort of determine what the setup is and process is as it relates and compares between Canada and the United States is a little tricky, but that's what I've been doing. Yeah. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the nice things about Lisa's site here is that she's trying to get out a lot of information about anosmia just for people that just might be curious and type in anosmia on a Google search or people that think they might have anosmia. And so she's, um, she's cut and pasted a lot of articles in here, both from medical journals and from newspaper <coughs> stories. And uh, one of the things she talked to me about doing was making sure that it's okay with, as far as copyright clearance goes, to have some of these on our website. Um, from, from, the, from what we know about fair use doctrine and copyrights, it, most of it's probably okay. Um, some of the more serious issues are with uh, some of the newspaper articles, and especially uh, right here, um, this uh, this hyperlink right here for hearing the word anosmia spoken, because she just kind of just kind of took that from <laughs> another website. But we're getting permission. <laughs> well, we're going to get permission on it, and I guess we'll have to take it down or come up with our own pronunciation of anosmia if uh, if it doesn't clear it. Um, and we've also got links to newspaper articles. These are probably. These are probably going to be okay, but they represent a little more of a problem. Um, it, it helps that most of them link directly to the websites of the newspaper. Um, that's generally not a problem. I mean, the, the only thing is, the, the only way you really know the way fair use doctrine works is it's an equitable defense. So you don't really know if it's okay to use something until somebody sues you and you win. And uh, hopefully we're not going to, hopefully that won't expand the scope of my duties to mounting a defense or anything. <laughs> But um, so what we decided to do is since since there's no way to know for sure, we're just going to try to contact all of the people that we've got links to and make sure that it's okay that we can use all their stuff. And it should probably be okay whether they say it's okay or not, and if they give us notice, then we can just take it down, I guess. Yeah. Find some find some better. We don't need the stupid stuff on there. Exactly. <laughs> Basically now, my work on a daily, daily basis just involves making sure that all the uh, 
corporate stuff is up to date. Um, every year there's an annual report you have to file. It's really very simple and basic. I'm sure that some people get confused because it's documents and legal words, but you just have to fill out a form every year that says the name of your corporation, um, who the directors are, if their addresses have changed, your office, your home address, which is just my parents' house in Canada, um, and basically your auditor's name, who's my parents' accountant. You know, like it's, it's all very doable. It's quite easy to just do this process and then you've got something that really helps people. And at this point, I mean, it did take a lot of work to set it up. It was basically every night for an entire summer I did this work. And, um, but now that it's been set up, it exists and I'm lucky to have a lot of people really helping me. And so basically, I guess my encouragement to you is that if you're interested in doing something like this, you really can do it. It's totally possible. And some people here might have already done something similar, so we're hoping that you can share your experiences with us too. Um, another thing that I was doing was actually, I had a questionnaire on my website, which is gone now for legal reasons, and um, it was there for two years, and it was basically um, people would just fill out how they got anosmia and what they think of it being a disability and other information. And all that data was collected, and I had them actually you know, click on a bullet point that said if they're willing to have their name and address or email address released to uh, scientific researchers or whoever. And most people said yes, of course, because they want you know, to get some answers. So this information was sent off to the Monell Chemical Census Clinic in Philadelphia, and uh, they're basically the biggest you know, group of researchers and people who do work on the chemical senses, so smell and taste. And um, all that information was um, being put together by one of their summer students, and we were hoping to publish the results in medical journals, and um, things were being written up. But then, uh, very recently, the um, medical legislation changed, and there's a new privacy rule. So, uh, you can't actually take people's <laughs> medical information of any kind without giving them full notice of what you're going to use it for, to simplify. And since I hadn't done that, now I've got all this information that wasn't really collected properly. And although I can guarantee to you that 99% of these people would be totally fine with using it in this way, we can't actually proceed with it. So if anybody wants to volunteer to work on some privacy issues, <laughs> we've got that. Um, so basically, I'm not sure what else I could say at this point, but I can play a little clip from an interview that I did on television in Canada, um, <laughs> which I can't bear to watch, but anyways. Um, basically, there was a sequence at the beginning that we're not gonna show where they came to my house and had me act out scenes from my life in which I couldn't smell things. And then um, they asked me a lot of questions. No, <laughs> maybe at the end, if you stick around till the end, <laughs> that's the bonus. <laughs> But um, so she asked me a lot of questions, which probably are the same questions that you might have been thinking to ask me about how it is to live without a sense of smell. So now I'm going to attempt to actually transfer this. Alice, did you want to speak first? Mm -hmm. Okay. Try to figure out how to do this. VCR. Play. And after this video plays, um, Carol's going to speak a little bit. And Lisa joins me now in the studio. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks. As you were growing up, before you got the diagnosis, were you consciously pretending to smell things when, when you really weren't smelling them? So you were sort of aware that there was a problem, or you just thought that this is this crazy things people did, putting flowers up to their nose? I just assumed that I was the same as most people. Some people had a stronger sense of smell, some people had a weaker one. I must have just had a weaker one. I never really paid much attention to it. And when they told you that you had anosmia, you said what? What is that? I sort of said, okay, well, I've got to go home and do the rest of my life now. I mean, it didn't, it wasn't the sort of thing where it sort of meant that I had to change aspects of my life. I mean, I got home and that day my father went out to the uh, hardware store and bought a smoke detector for every single room of our house because uh, just having one in the hallway wasn't enough. I mean, I couldn't smell the smoke. So, I mean, little changes like that had to happen. Um, I became aware that now perfumes obviously meant something different to other people than they did to me. I became much more aware of it, but it didn't change my life in any great respect. But that's interesting because not having the sense of smell carries a lot of other things with it. And, and, be, and you ended up setting up a website to sort of get all these people who have anosmia together to talk about it and what sort of issues come up. I mean, the taste one has got to be a huge one. That's the first thing people always ask me, well, if you can't smell, how can you taste? And I just try to explain it as how there's taste and there's flavors. I have a tongue with taste buds on it, so I can taste, but I don't sense flavors, which means that to me, coffee tastes like coffee, but flavored coffee also tastes like coffee. It all just tastes the same. 
So at a basic level, I do have tastes, but I don't have flavors. So is there enjoyment in eating or not as much as for other people? I'm sure not as much as for other people. Also, the whole sort of aura of eating. You go into a restaurant, it smells a certain way, or you're sitting in the living room and you can smell what's cooking in the kitchen, the anticipation of it, um, the aromas, the savoring, all of that is missing. But the texture, um, the taste of it, that's still there. And one of the things that you mentioned, and it's probably something you learned through your website, but the, the problem that people have uh, who have anosmia with, with anorexia, for example. Absolutely. Well, for me, it's different because I was born without a sense of smell. So what happens is I've never known that things taste differently. Whereas if somebody suddenly loses their sense of smell, which of course can happen in many different ways, um, brain trauma, head injury, sinus problems, suddenly all of those flavors, which I never understood anyhow, all of that is missing for them. So either the food just tastes very bland um, and they just don't want to eat it, they just lose all interest in eating food and they develop an eating disorder, or it's the opposite. They try to eat as much as they can because they hope that maybe something will taste better and um, they gain a lot of weight. Now, you have had a chance to be in discussions <coughs> with some doctors in the States who think that they may be able to help you. That's right. What have they told you and what, what are your thoughts around getting your sense of smell back? Well, it's not a question of getting it back, it would be getting something completely new. I've never had a sense of smell, so it's not that we could reverse the process, whereas for some people, if they've maybe got a, a little tumor or a polyp or something, it can be removed, and they'll get their sense of smell back. Whereas for me, it's um, more of a part of the brain that never mm -hmm. developed, it's just not there, and so without some kind of brain regeneration or something like that, I don't really see how anybody could help me. I know there are little devices I could buy, little sort of fake noses, uh, robotic noses that I could buy, which maybe would do the same thing. But in terms of getting a sense of smell, um, I don't know if I would really even want one. I mean, why is that? Well, I would want one for the just the reasons of the safety. I mean, smelling gas, gas leaks or um, smoke or, you know, having a child and not being able to smell if her diaper is dirty. All of these things I feel I'm really missing out on. I would want those, but everything else, I just don't feel it's really necessary. When you talk about missing out on stuff, you know, when you have when you have start having a family and the, and the diaper changes, because that's kind of the tried and true method, mm -hmm. as, as disgusting as it sounds. Right. But what other things do you think are lacking in your life because of not being able to smell? Well, it's interesting. I mean, before I started doing all this research and getting in touch with all these people, I just had no idea what I was missing. I never thought about it. But I get letters from people who say, you know, I can't smell my husband anymore, I can't smell my children anymore, and they're devastated, it ruins their life. And I start thinking, I wonder what my little cousin smells like, I wonder what my boyfriend smells like, you know, I wonder what those flowers smell like. And then I feel a little bit sad that I'm missing out on that, but at the same time, it's not sort of the longing for what, I'm, what I've lost, which is what they're feeling. Do most people understand, do they know what anosmia is? I mean, it seems like it's a relatively rare thing. It seems rare, but I think that's because people just don't really talk about it. I find that if you just start talking about it, there's always someone, someone knows, who's lost their sense of smell somehow. So I think that most people just don't want to talk about it. I mean, smell can be sort of taboo sometimes. Also, of course, it's not as bad as losing vision or losing your hearing. So, But it's definitely not rare. I mean, millions and millions of people do suffer from it. So do you worry when you go out? I mean, what if I smell bad? No, and I, I don't know it. Everyone else does. I do. I tell my friends, tell me what I smell like. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry about offending me. Just tell me. I need to know. How else will I know? So I mean, I let people choose perfumes for me. Only you know, my aunt, who's very close with me, I let her select a perfume. So you she wear knows. perfume? I do. You know, I let you know, a very close best friend since childhood. I let her choose a perfume for me, but nobody else. I mean, if I was to receive perfume as a gift from someone, I absolutely would never wear it. They could pull some pretty nasty pranks on you, I think. Absolutely, that would be terrible. <laughs> okay, we're gonna take a break. We're gonna we're gonna catch up with you a little bit later in the show. But coming up next, you're gonna meet a man who lost his sense of smell about 20 years ago and is now starting to get a little bit of it back. We'll meet him in just a moment. Please stay with us. <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions? Just ask me right now. You can ask me anything. <laughs> and on TV saying it all right. Okay, um, if you want but I can show more of this afterwards. They interview another man who uh, wasn't born with a sense of smell, like me. He was actually, um, he lost his sense of smell. I forget exactly how, but he talks about it. And then they bring on a doctor who describes exactly how smell works, and, and there's sort of a panel discussion. So I can show this at the end of them, if anyone wants to stick around and watch the rest of it. And oh, this is just something that I had mentioned when I said there are fake noses. There are different kinds of things you can actually buy which I'm going to buy when I get a dog, which this, you know, tells you that your pet has made a mess. Um, and there's actually
actually a clinic here at Duke, uh, which does some really interesting work. They've got this olfactometer and centometer electronic noses and stuff like that uh, that are available, but they're not really available for individual use. They're more for industrial use, and so they're like $10,000 per item, and so I can never have one for myself, but I mean, companies do have them and use them. So, yeah. And this thing up here is with me in case people think of things they want to ask you. Um, I have a handbell that I took from the um, North Carolina Center for Nonprofits about um, the duties of being on boards. We're always, oh, thank you. <laughs> Forgot. <coughs> We're always talking about um, <coughs> what we want to accomplish in life. Around here, we're talking about our future jobs, um, but and, or we're talking about pro bono. But a huge way that, that people serve is by being on boards. Um, and my guess is that, that a number of you in the room are already aware of that and are doing that kind of work. So. Um, I would like to take a few minutes and, and as an initial contribution, about a 10-sentence ten, ten summary of, of what you might be doing and involved with already. Um, I know Keisha and Ian are, are very active in boards, and who else is um, on one already? Zach, okay, so why don't the three of you talk about what you've been doing with boards already? Nope. <laughs> um, I sit on the board of uh, the Carefree Foundation, which is a uh, healthcare nonprofit. Uh, yeah, I will say this again so that Mr. Microphone can hear me. Um, I sit on the board of the Carefree Foundation, which is a healthcare nonprofit. Um, the mission is eventually to build a society where. Um, Healthcare will not fall along poverty lines. People who are poor can get identical health care to anyone else. Um, and currently, we're working on two projects. Um, one project is a clinic restoration project in Washington, D.C., um, to restore the uh, facilities of the free clinic so they actually look like a place where you can get healing. Um, a lot of painting and renovations and stuff like that. And then the other project, which is much more ambitious, is to fly. Um, Ethiopian patients um, from Ethiopia who have who need, require cataract surgery um, and give them that surgery in addition to training some of the doctors that we're planning on applying as well. Um, and our ultimate goal is to build a relationship with this community such that we can train their doctors and they can they can recognize which patients need services that can only be provided in the United States and we can identify those patients and fly them over here. Um, I mean, I guess the main challenges that we've encountered so far is, you know, one is always legitimizing ourselves. Um, you know, you just have to prove that you're act that you actually exist and you're actually doing something. Um, and then beyond that, um, we have a very diverse board, but um, in terms of experience. But of course, the challenge of diversity is always that um, the left hand doesn't always know what the right hand is doing. Um, you know, I'm the only I'm the the only person with legal training on the board, and I discovered very quickly that our board hasn't voted to delegate any authority to the officers, which means that nothing we have done has been legal so far. <laughs> um, and so it's just one of those. You know, likewise, there's projects going on that are medical projects that the medical doctors on the board are doing, and people ask me about them, and I use all the wrong terminology and sound like an idiot. Um, so there's certainly a matter of um, cross education that needs to go on. But for the most part, considering that we're a fairly young organization, I found it very successful at this point. And if you could pass that to Keisha. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, in the future. <laughs> I know that's her career goal. <laughs> um, Zach, let me bring the microphone back to you. <coughs> um, I. Uh, <coughs> When I returned from the Peace Corps, I started a, with a few other people, started a nonprofit incorporated in Hawaii, uh, which is just because I happen to be living there, uh, to uh, s continue supporting an indigenous group that I had spent a lot of time working with while I was in the Peace Corps. 
Um, we're, we've applied for a 501c3 status, but we're still waiting to hear from the IRS. It takes a while. And just to, it's been, um, it's been rewarding in a lot of ways. We've gotten some grants from some organizations to do a couple of projects. The main one is a helping the indigenous, three of the communities of the indigenous group get tenure to the land that they've occupied. Um, but like Ian says, it's, it's certainly with, our problem is we have board members all over the place. I'm here, we've got one in California, one in Arizona, and two in Micronesia. And so a lot of, it's interesting, a lot of times the law is a little bit, hasn't quite caught up to the level of, of technological communication because we can communicate and carry on our business fairly effectively, but it, we still have to meet some of the requirements like one annual meeting, which um, is more difficult than, than it needs to be, I guess. Anybody else on the board? Oh. Not currently, but just last year I served. As, I guess it, it's good to have a young trustee where a graduating student serves at, for three years on a term. I served, we had ex officio members where a student through student government activity served as a full voting member, so it was a little bit different. Had kind of a role of advocacy for students, but also had the obligation to serve, you know, maintain all these duties as a full board member. And there are the challenges where an organization may be somewhere legitimacy. The sense that this institution had a chip on its shoulder that you know we hadn't broken certain uh, national lists and rankings that mm -hmm. that certain was a priority of the president. So um, that was that was a priority that the, the board rallied on. But noticing that on this list, I think five is as high as financial contribution makes for for an organization like a particularly higher education institution or maybe some of the larger nonprofit organizations. I think maybe fundraising, while well, maybe not listed as high as five. Uh, Certainly, is at least a threshold at which you couldn't conceive of being on a board of that caliber without. Um, so I could never dream of you know going back and trying to be on the board of, of my educational institution without lots of donations. Yeah, yeah. Certainly, boards at certain levels, um, there. When people want you on their board, it's for a reason. It's either going to be because you can give them money, or you, you can give them expertise, or you can give them contacts to to somebody else. Um, I, I look back at my bio <laughs> this morning um, to see what I have been on, and I'm going to tell you what they are for two reasons. One is to illustrate that when you get out there in the world, everybody's going to be after you to be on boards. If, if they miss you, uh, it's a rarity because you are seen as community leaders by, just by virtue of your expertise as a lawyer, and, and people ask you to be on boards. Um, and the other reason I want to, to <coughs> tell you this list is because of the variety of board experiences and what you do on them will vary so much by the type of board it is. Um, I've been, on, my first two boards were startup domestic violence groups in two counties back when people didn't talk about domestic violence. So that was created because there's this urgent need in the community for shelters that didn't exist at that time, et cetera. So that was just really <coughs> grassroots, what do we do to, to fill this urgent need? I'm currently on Carolina Legal Assistance Board, which is uh, a legal aid for uh, people with mental health problems. Uh, there, that's a program that's existed for a long time, and they always need money, and they're always looking for ways to tap somebody to keep the money coming, despite uh, decades of success as a very <coughs> complex legal organization, doing complex legal work. I was on the founding board of the North Carolina Association of Women Attorneys, and there we just spent a whole year really doing formative work, fig figuring out what we wanted to accomplish as a group of women when women were first getting in the legal profession. Uh, on the North Carolina Child Daycare Commission for eight years, and that, that's a government kind of board uh, where you're actually adjudicating and rulemaking. Um, so it's a little bit different from a nonprofit board, but it's a whole different set of experiences. And in that job, I don't know any time I've ever been more challenged as a, t for using my lawyer skills in these very tight clashes over policy issues like corporal punishment and child staff ratios. And um, that was a very intense experience. Uh, the 10th Judicial District Board, uh, a bar group, the North Carolina uh, Bar Association, a board of governors, a uh, place like the North Carolina Bar Association, that is so established and it has such an established executive director that there are decisions to be made, that, but somebody's running that organization so tightly that board members um, 
you know, they get the smaller, I guess they get big decisions too, but it's probably more at the executive committee level in, and working with a long established director. So that's another kind of experience you'll see. And on the National Board of the Reginald Heber Smith Community <coughs> Lawyer Fellowship Program, which is a uh, postgraduate fellowship program, um, there's somebody else that already made the decision and I was window dressing. Um, and then the founding chair of the North Carolina Center for Nonprofits. I had a, I have a friend who, uh, she wanted to really work on helping other boards, and it was her dream to create this organization in this state. And a lot of states have it. So, a second part of this is if you're working on board uh, <coughs> and you want to learn more about what it's like in every state, probably there is this backup center that uh, that assists people in learning what it is that boards do. And they have a website that I've put on your on the handout where I got these that will answer so many questions about uh, about being on board. So um, you will be asked to be on boards. Uh, they will vary greatly depending on the kind of, whether it's a startup, an ongoing, a strong director, a weak director, a crisis. Uh, one of the hardest things you might ever have to do is decide if a director has to go. Uh, there could be huge fights within nonprofits like there could be anywhere else and staff <coughs> dissension and you have to figure out when to step in and when to back off, when to trust the director and when not. Uh, unfortunately, not all the time do you get to really get into the mission. I, I hear attorneys complain like attorneys on legal aid boards will say, oh, I, I joined this legal aid board because I love the issues that they deal with and I wasn't getting that in my practice so I wanted to be on the board and all we do is review personnel policies and the audit and everything. So there's a whole lot of technical dry stuff that can happen. Or you can be on a board that really needs your uh, substantive policy direction where you really get to, to use that. You might be on a board because you already know a lot about an issue area or you might be on one because a friend of yours works there and you want to support them. So uh, again, it varies all over the place. Um, I've been sort of passive with my boards. I haven't sought anything. They, it's been like, okay, here comes this opportunity. If you really want to do something that uh, you care about, you can campaign for it. I mean, these, these boards that Steve was talking about, these higher education groups, uh, they become huge. Some of them are appointed by the legislature. They become huge political uh, fights to, to get on the board. Um, and there are a lot of, uh, it's amazing really because people spend a lot of volunteer time on boards um, and, and it takes away from your earning time and all the other things you do in your life and yet some of these are considered so desirable by people that there's just huge fights to be one of the people giving away your time like that. Um, and again, in a lot of cases they're looking for people with, with deep pockets. Um, there are a couple of courses that if you really want to get into boards, um, you might consider taking here at Duke Law School. One is, is now called Non-Exempt Organizations. What's the name of the uh, Schmalbach Klotfelter course? You probably know, Steve. It's a tax exempt organization. Tax I think that's the name of it. Uh, just to they'll learn the whole tax side of it. Um, and then Joel Fleischman's course, and Steve's a TA for, for him. Uh, phila um, philanthropy and volunteerism. Okay, the volunteer sector is what it's called now. Um, that's also a great website to go to that course and get links to. to um, he knows how to tap um, sources of money to support the nonprofit sector, um, Professor Fleischman, and has been a leader in doing that. Uh, if you are a new member of a board and you are an attorney, uh, typical things they'll ask you to do. Uh, and as you heard from Ian, they'll ask you to do it before you are an attorney. Um, and that's something you have to be careful on, of course, always, uh, whether the <coughs> boards or anywhere else. People are going to ask your legal advice now that you've stepped through the threshold into law school, uh, never mind that you're not licensed to give it yet. So, you know, always remember to, to be careful even if you know the answer and be sure that whatever advice you're giving, you're giving it as a board member, not as an attorney, which you're not yet. If you are an attorney, be sure it's something you actually know what to do. Uh, if it's a new board, though, typically you're going to be called on to write, um, to draft uh, articles of incorporation uh, and bylaws. They love, they assume that you're a good uh, wordsmith and that you can really help with that, and you probably are. So that's a great role for a, an attorney on the board. 
Um, the other thing, if they have, have just started, is getting the 501c3 tax exemption. Um, and, and that also is a fairly easy process, and the Secretary of State's office is going to have kits to guide you through the process. So uh, that's something that, that you can probably do, even if you didn't take the course or don't think that prior to that you have much um, to contribute on that. But after that, it can go anywhere. You could be called on to review contracts. Uh, some nonprofits form private subsidiaries. Lots of very complicated tax issues about spin-off organizations. And so don't get over your head on that. Uh, but um, there are lots of things you can do wearing your non-attorney hat as well. And, and they've got, a, this is a fairly simple list of um, here that I won't review, but those are uh, typical things you do. Find money for them, huge, um, whether it's uh, you uh, giving money or you uh, adding personal <coughs> notes to their solicitations that go out or you getting on the phone to somebody or arranging to have lunch with the executive director and your friend. Uh, all that is uh, crucial, especially for these grassroots organizations. It's a little quick uh, review of what boards do, so um, questions, comments, more pizza, mm -hmm. more clip, more film clip. <laughs> so I want to ask you, so if, what, what, uh, what's the vision for Post Incorporation when you are able to develop a, a larger funding base or any funding at all, I guess? Yeah. What, what can you do, what's that going to allow you to do that you can't do now? <coughs> Well, the problem is right now that there's no money, and of course I can't raise any because, I mean, I could just get people to give me money without any tax receipt, but that's not really going to work. So um, once I do that, and of course, like I think you were saying, or someone was saying, it takes a few months really for the government to give it to you, probably a year, maybe longer. So if I can actually do that, I would like to make this a much bigger organization. I mean, if I could have someone in charge of actually doing all the... Um, work for in terms of lobbying the government, um, trying to get some changes made to health legislation and particularly trying to make it easier for people to get um, their medical plans to pay for treatment because in Canada medical care is free, right? It's very different from here and basically you just have to take your Medicare card and go to the hospital or the doctor, whatever you want and you get everything for free but doctors aren't really <coughs> willing to do something, some kind of treatment for nausea because it's pretty rare. and. They just don't want to be involved whatsoever. So even in Canada, where healthcare is free, you still can't get help for this. Mm -hmm. And here, if you actually look, um, I've got a page on health insurance here, but if you actually look in some health insurance policies, they do say anosmia. We cover um, some treatments for anosmia, and it's actually, it actually was shocking to me when I found that. And it was only recently that I started to find that. But um, you have to prove it through an objective test, and this is really difficult to do because everybody could say, oh, I can't smell anything. I swear, <laughs> I need lots of money for treatment. And uh, there are tests that are done. I've got a, a bunch of them listed on this page, actually. And you can go to a doctor and do these objective tests. But this so far hasn't really been tested. No one's actually gone, as far as I know, through the process, done the tests, got a doctor to certify it, and actually gotten their health insurance plan to pay for it. So these are some changes I really are very important that need to be done quickly. Um, another thing is educating the legal and the medical profession, both, because disability law is a big thing. And I don't want to make anyone angry or have people saying, like, your disability is really, it's not a disability, it's nothing, it just affects your quality of life. I mean, like, obviously, I mean, the people who advocate for blind and deaf people need a lot of resources, and for another disability to come in and say, we want some of those resources too, it's not going to um, work very well. So that needs to start changing first in people's perceptions and then later in the legislation and how it's uh, reflected. And the medical profession needs to get involved in a much bigger way than they are now. And people have asked me, do I, ha do I have a brochure that I can hand out? And I don't. And it would be very easy for someone to just cut and paste a few of the you know, paragraphs from here, put it into you know, like an Adobe brochure style format, post it on the website. That would just take someone a few hours and you know, it wouldn't really cost that much. And it just has to be done. And so there are a lot of little things like that. I actually um, printed off a bunch of pages from the website and took them to the um, doctor's education clinic at my old university, University of Toronto. And they were very interested in educating their doctors about anosmia because they just hadn't ever had a brochure to hand around or had any information. So these are all things that they take little amounts of money, little amounts of effort, but they add up to a huge thing. And so, I mean, I've got you know a job at a law firm. I can't really do, I can take all my free time to do this, but I can't do more than that. So 
if suddenly I was to receive a huge amount of donations that could pay for a salary for me to do this work or a salary for someone else to do this work or even a few people to work part time, you know, two weeks a year or whatever it was. Great things could happen, but in the meantime, it's just coming out of my pocket and my time and not so many great things can happen. I think it's pretty great anyhow, but nothing really further can happen. Oh, that's interesting about your, your, you see your future as supporting this, not as the staff person for it. If, even if you got the money, you would say you're more inclined to hire someone mm -hmm. than, to, than that to be your job. Uh, but this will always be... It'll be part of it. Actually, my law firm where I'm going to be working, um, they do mm -hmm. some nonprofit work and they were very interested in maybe helping out a little bit with some legal work or you know, maybe giving some pro bono hours from the lawyers at the firm to do this work, which is fantastic. If I can somehow arrange that and I can stay at this firm for a while and this can go on, and that would be a great way to solve the problem because I could do some work pro bono and other people could contribute. The other thing that some of you might consider is, uh, and this is the hard way to go, so I'm not <coughs> suggesting this as, as your money-making career, uh, but it is creating your own nonprofit. I mean, there are post-graduate um, fellowships you can apply for to, to add a project onto an existing 501c3, but you can, and many before you have done so, create your whole nonprofit yourself and start from scratch and then the challenge is attracting the money uh, to be and, and gaining the expertise legally which you ought to be able to do um, to pull it together and build your staff and proceed in life doing exactly what you have in mind and that be your full-time activity okay well uh, do you want to, I think Lisa's going to put this on another clip so you can either stay and watch and eat more pizza or, or, you can. or <laughs> go to the next event. <laughs> thank you for coming. And let's thank Lisa for what she's given us this year.
I, I was on the Indian song for a week. <laughs> and twice during that week, um, I was eating, and suddenly, you know, I bit into a piece of crunchy lettuce, and all of a sudden, I got this really strong, I think, lettuce aroma, taste, whatever, which was so far beyond anything I've had in years. Which is interesting because lettuce is not something that has a particularly strong taste or smell. I guess not. Um, I, I can't recall, you know. And I, the one thing I think about is if I ever get this back, um, I almost feel like I'm going to hide away by myself in a cabin and just, just like smell the it. most ordinary things. Yeah. I'd be thrilled to smell you know, the, this table kind of thing, but I, I can't. So you, you, you had some success with uh, the lettuce and anything else with the French zone? And then two days later, I put into a taco and I could really taste the cherry cheese. And it was just so much more intense than I usually smell or taste. So when you're walking around, I mean, do most people understand and how to get to the charm the vast majority people have ever heard of before? No, no one knows what it is. And I'm surprised because when I tell people what I've got, it, it comes up with you. And um, I'll tell them what I've got. And invariably, they have one or two people who've got it. And then they ask all the usual, uh, all the usual questions, the cliche questions.